Good evening, everybody. The Biochemical Society and Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of our biochemistry focus webinar series. Topics in the series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. Consult the uh, website for further details. So my name is uh, Richie Porter, and I'm based at the School of Biochemistry and Immunology here in Trinity College, Dublin, otherwise known as the University of Dublin, Trinity College. Uh, and I'm very happy to, and, and delighted to chair this session today. The webinar is part of our dedicated early career research program of webinars. And we're delighted to provide this opportunity today for Anna, Danielle, and Gail to share their work with the molecular biosciences community. Today's webinar is titled Developments in the Immune System and Immunotherapies, and we will hear from three early career researchers who will share their current work in this field. Okay, so uh, before I head over to our first speaker, I'd like to mention that questions will be asked at the end of the webinar, but please do send in your questions during the talks. If you have a question, please type in the question box as shown in the image on the screen, stating who your question is for, and we will try and answer as many as possible at the end. Our first uh, invited speaker today is Anna Bajura from King's College London. Anna completed her PhD in developmental cell biology at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden. Anna is currently a postdoctoral researcher in the group of Dr. Kathleen Spillan at King's College London, investigating the role of mechanical forces in B cell activation, with a special focus on the role of actin-dependent regulation of plasma membrane organization. Today, Anna will discuss her work on modifying interaction between the actin cytocortex and plasma membrane, shapes B cell activation, a new role for CD20. I'll hand over to you, Anna. Hello, thank you. I hope you can hear me well. Um, let me just uh, quickly get the pointer. Um, yeah, thank you very much for giving me the chance to talk um, about our work um, investigating the role of CD20 in B cell activation. So, B cells, um, as a response to either pathogen entry or vaccination, can become activated, and this um, then drives production of antibodies. Um, which will be able to bind to antigens um, on pathogens or toxins and by this neutralize them or drive other immune cells to immune responses. And um, normally antigens are presented on the surface of antigen presenting cells. So sorry for that. Um, yeah, and um, this then leads to activation of B cells. And this response has to be basically just right. So in case um, activation is too low, this may lead to immune deficiencies. However, if this activation is too high, uh, this would give rise to autoimmunity, allergies, or cancer. Um, and there are multiple ways how uh, B cells activation is regulated. One of them, one of the proteins that is very important uh, in activating B cells um, is CD20. It's a transmembrane protein that is localized basically um, together with B cell receptor and um, in resting cells. Um, what happens is that actin confines the movement of both B cell receptor and um, all the molecules that are surrounding it. Upon uh, antigen binding, this actin um, cortex that is below the membrane is assembled. And this allows uh, increased mobility of the B cell receptor, which will then allow for clustering of um, B cell receptors um, and formation of microclusters. At the same time, CD20 has to be removed from the plasma uh, from the vicinity of um, B cell receptors in order to allow for the binding between B cell receptor and CD19, which is a co-stimulatory protein. And this is important because it um, will only allow uh, for a, a regulation of downstream signaling mobilization of calcium and leads to transcriptional changes. At the same time, what is also known is that decrease in CD20 levels 
is associated with um, differentiation of B cells into antibody producing plasma cells. And I think very important for today's talk um, is that um, CD20 is an outstanding immunotherapy target. Um, it's used to treat a cancer or autoimmune disease. At the same time, we know that level of CD20 uh, is associated with the ag aggressiveness of, um, for example, uh, leukemias. And despite this huge importance, we know very little about the exact function of this protein in uh, B cell activation. And this is why our group um, decided to work on this question. So um, the way we approach um, studying B cell uh, receptor signaling um, is we use reductionist approach. So in order to mimic antigen presenting cell, we use uh, supported lipid bilayers. Uh, that are loaded with antigens uh, with uh, fluorophores. And this enables us uh, following the activation of B cells because we can basically follow every binding impact event within the B cell using TIF microscopy. And at the same time, by combining this with um, looking at calcium signaling, in this case, we can look at initiation of signaling. So you can see here over time, um, if we allow B cells to activate with antigens, we will get this nice immunological synapse and we can observe also level of signaling using calcium. We were also very fortunate um, to have received um, CRISPR generated um, CD20 knockout cells, uh, Ramos cells from the group of Michał Schmida in Czechia. And uh, we decided to of course test them using microscopy. And I hope you will appreciate here then in the control, which has only Cas9 expression. We can hit, have very nice calcium accumulation in the whole cell. And when we look at the CD20 knockout cells, this calcium is localized um, only to small subsets of the cell and very often localizes together with membrane deformations that look like skip labs. Um, so this is something that um, we quantified as well in our cells. And uh, we observed that uh, indeed CD20 knockout shows increased blebbing, which is not associated with um, defects in proliferation of, or increased dying, uh, which to us suggests that um, this losing of CD20 affects immune synapse shape, um, potentially also membrane tension. And what causes blebbing and how blebbing normally occurs is um, if we can see um, our cells basically um, acting cortex is always underlying um, the membrane and it's attached to the membrane by linker proteins which mostly consist of uh, ERM proteins and the best example of this is ESRIN. And either if we lose um, linkers or if we have very high local pressure in our cells, um, this can lead to membrane detachment and this is one of the greatest causes of blebbing, so you can see um, it being basically occurred um, just because of the hydrostatic pressure um, within the cell. Um, and we tested whether this membrane detachment plays a role in our CD20 knockout cells. And as you can see, we have basically no change at the level of um, phosphorylated azine, which suggests that membrane detachment is not a problem uh, in our CD20 knockout cells. The other cause of blebbing can be simply effect, defect in the actin cortex, um, which first of all can be due to changes in the membrane tension or um, actin disassembly that is increased. And this, of course, will result in blebbing as well. So we looked at the main constituent of uh, actin cortex, which is F actin uh, in B cells, and we see that upon activation, indeed, uh, we see an um, increased, uh, decreased um, actin accumulation after five minutes of stimulation. Um, so the next thing we wanted to know is whether also cells that are resting, so unstimulated, have uh, decreased actin levels. And indeed, this is what we see. So already um, at the resting cell the state, B cells that don't have CD20 have less act F actin. Um, and what does it mean? Why, why this is really important? And um, as I already mentioned to you, um, actin restricts or confines B cell receptors. 
And upon antigen binding, what happens is that um, locally actin becomes disassembled, and this allows uh, increased mobility of the PC receptor. And the fact that it can bind together means that basically it can form microclusters and drive signaling. So what we were speculating is that in case of our CD20 knockout cells, because we observed from the beginning reduced actin density, which is enhanced upon antigen binding, we would expect even more um, clusters uh, that are signaling active and potentially um, because of this increased signaling. So this is what we again tested uh, using imaging. Um, so here, first, I will show you an example from the Cas9, so the control cells, and you can see um, clusters um, that form. And this you can probably maybe better appreciate on the steels from the movie as well. I just highlighted a couple of them, and you can hopefully appreciate that the clusters will grow over time. And when we look at calcium level, you can also see that calcium very nicely corresponds uh, with the antigen signal. Uh, and then when we compare this with the CD20 knockout, uh, probably, hopefully already from some of the steels or the movie, you can see that in some cases, um, I think uh, antigen clusters are larger in our CD20 knockout cells. So we can here, is, for example, see at um, 30 seconds, the clusters will be significantly larger um, than in case of the control cells. And also, quite interestingly, we observe um, that in contrast to our control cells, we see a lot of um, calcium spikes that don't exactly correspond to antigen binding, which suggests increased um, signaling. And when we look at the cluster growth, we see that indeed this is increased in comparison to the control and also antigen accumulation over time um, is increased at the immune signups in CD20 knockout cells. So of course, um, there is some, um, let's say, hypothesis that maybe um, indeed signaling is affected and also based on the blebbing that the signup structure may be affected. So in order to look at this, uh, we tend to look at um, the level of phosphotyrosine because it's very very well established that um, in normal cells, um, this phosphotyrosine generates basically like a ring outside of the edges of the cell and is downregulated in the center, as you can see hopefully on this image. Um, and when we looked at CD20 knockout cells, we saw that um, this downregulation basically in the center of the cell doesn't really um, occur and maybe even better you can see this from the graph. So basically in the central part we see a dip in the uh, phosphotyrosine intensity in the Cas9 cells and when we look towards the edges we really see an increase and when we compare this with the CD20 knockout cells basically the line stays pretty flat so we don't see this downregulation that is normally observed and overall phosphotyrosine levels are also significantly increased in the CD20 knockout cells, which again suggests uh, the role of CD20 um, in downregulating early B cell receptor signaling. And in terms of um, looking at the mechanism, um, we kind of had to look back um, at what is already known about the physiological level uh, of CD20. And what I told you before during the introduction is that um, normally, uh, CD20 is downregulated during um, differentiation towards plasma cells, um, which produce antibodies. And one thing that um, was recently um, highlighted uh, was that those cells also undergo metabolic changes. And a very nice uh, work from the group of Michael Reff recently showed um, that CD20 knockout indeed has um, increased a metabolic activity. So here you can see increased consumption of oxygen um, and um, also mitochondrial activity is increased. And this is very important because when cells prepare to producing antibodies, of course, they need to secrete and produce it with proteins. And one of the proteins uh, involved in metabolic uh, regulation is mTOR. And it's also important um, in uh, differentiation to, towards plasma cells. So when we looked at mTORC signature in our CD20 knockout, we observed that 
the most important targets of activation is are indeed increased um, and therefore we decided to test whether inhibiting mTOR um, in our CD20 knockout can rescue the phenotype. So here once again I'm showing you um, basically what happens to the immune synapse um, in our CD20 cells. So we can see that cells bleb can also see the quantification and um, actin, F-actin levels are decreased. And when we look at the inhibition of mTOR signaling, both with taurine or here both with rapamycin and taurine, we can see that we can basically rescue the blebbing and also um, actin levels come back to normal. And I mean, even if you just look purely at the synapse, it's almost perfect. Um, and I think this is very important and I think interesting because it shows you how a metabolic regulation can at the same time feed back to the plasma membrane ability of cells to activate. And this is just a summary of what I showed you today. Um, so I showed you that um, CD20 knockout uh, in B cells leads to the to a defect in the actin cortex and immune synapse shape as observed by the increased blebbing. And this um, correlates with increased antigen clustering and signaling levels. And at the same time, I showed you that um, the metabolic change probably mostly depends on um, the activation of mTOR in CD20 and um, contributes to the actin cortex phenotype that we observe. And I think this is, again, very important when we think about um, human physiology, because we very often forget how metabolism can um, affect basically how well our immune system works. And I think this is a very interesting time also to look at metabolism and regulation of uh, both B cell activation, but also looking at mechanobiology of cells. And with this, I would just like to acknowledge um, everyone um, that contributed to the work uh, and my boss, uh, Caitlin Spillain, who allowed me to uh, conduct the project, and especially the students um, that did a lot of work. So Anissa did the whole image analysis pipeline that we used to look at signaling. And currently we have two uh, students, um, one looking at um, actin regulation, actin regulatory proteins, and Kia uh, is looking at a structure function analyzing CD20. And yeah, with this, I would like to thank you also for your attention. And yeah, later on, wait for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. That was a very uh, insightful uh, lecture. We'll, 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 again, if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll ask at the end of the three seminars. So next up, our second invited speaker is Daniel Gonzalez Conero from the Rockefeller University. Daniel obtained his PhD in 2017 from the University of Birmingham, UK, studying how measles virus invades human cells. Later, Daniel moved to the Rockefeller University of New York, where he's been studying how viral RNA is recognized by the cell as foreign RNA. Daniel has been studying an antiviral protein called ZAP, zinc finger antiviral protein, that binds to CPG dinucleotides present in viral RNA and selectively targets this RNA for degradation. More recently, he's applied this knowledge to develop live attenuated vaccines that are conditionally inhibited by the presence of ZAP. So today, Daniel will present his work titled Delineation of Optimal RNA Targets for Zinc Finger Antiviral Protein Enables Conditionally Attenuated Virus Design. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Richard. And uh, thank you for the society to let me present my work here today. Uh, so, um, as Richard said, I did my postdoc in uh, the Rockefeller University, and the work I'm going to talk about today is mostly of that. Um, however, I just joined uh, Imperial College London as a fellow. Um, so, most of my talk today is going to be about a protein called zinc finger antiviral protein, or ZAP. And as the name suggests, this protein inhibits the replication of viruses by recognizing CG dinucleotides in viral RNA. And we think uh, this protein does that primarily by targeting virus RNA for degradation, but it can also block protein translation and induce the production of interferon. Um, and we've known about ZAP for 
two decades now. It was initially uh, described to inhibit the replication of murine leukemia virus, and ever since has been implicated in the replication of many more RNA and DNA viruses. And I got interested in this, in this protein while a few years ago, we made a mutant of HIV-1 that encoded for exactly the same protein sequence that had a collection of synonymous mutations in the envelope gene. And this virus uh, replicated very slowly in T cells in culture, here shown in red, and in black, you see uh, the wild type, HIV. However, when we re uh, replicated this virus in ZAP knockout cells, the virus was completely fine. And we showed that uh, ZAP was binding directly to CG10 nucleotides in viral RNA and inhibiting virus replication this way. We've also solved the structure of the uh, RNA binding domain of ZAP, binding to um, uh, viral RNA. And we found that one molecule of ZAP binds one CG uh, dinucleotide at the time, which created a problem because we knew that a single CG dinucleotide was insufficient for a virus attenuation. Um, so there must be an arrangement of CGs in the viral RNA that allows for um, virus attenuation by the activity of ZAP. And that's discovering these features, the question that I uh, addressed. So I looked at the number of features, including the number of CG dinucleotides, the spacing between those CG dinucleotides in the viral RNA, and the overall composition of the sequencing surrounding um, those CGs. So to look at that, I generated a collection of mutants of HIV that, again, they all encoded for exactly the same protein sequence, but had uh, increments of single CGs in the envelope region. And what we found was when replicating these viruses, we saw that the higher the number of CGs we had introduced, the slower the virus replication. And we can see this better if we trace a line on day four and this graph here, and we plot it over here, and we see that a single dinucleotide, a CG dinucleotide increments had a very small but incremental effect in virus replication. And all these viruses were completely fine when this was, uh, when they were replicating in ZAP knockout cells. Right, so then I looked at the spacing between CGs. And for that, I made another collection of mutants that they all had the same number of CG dinucleotides, but CGs were placed further and further away from each other. And what I saw is when those CGs were less than 12 nucleotides away from each other, then they replicated fairly fine. If we increase the spacing to 12 to 32 nucleotides, then the viruses were much more attenuated. And if we increase the spacing even further, then we start seeing that these viruses were replicating a little bit better, suggesting that there is an optimal spacing uh, that uh, ZAP binds to and confers ZAP sensitivity. And when thinking about why this might be happening, I came up with this hypothesis that perhaps when one ZAP is binding to one CG, it may occlude neighboring CG dinucleotides, preventing other molecules of ZAP to bind to these ones. However, if those CGs are spread across the virus RNA, then multiple molecules of ZAP can bind to the same RNA. And to test that, I used a technique called ClipSeq, in which I isolated the RNA that ZAP was binding, and I sequenced that. And what I'm showing you here is a zoomed-in view of the region of the genome that I've modified. Every uh, circle here in the bottom is one CG. So no CGs, we, very, we see very little binding. When we add 15 CGs, but they're all really close together. Again, we see very little binding. And when you take these CGs and you spread them out across the virus uh, genome, you see much more binding, suggesting that this is probably what's happening um, when ZAP is binding to these viruses. And finally, I looked at the effects of the uh, context in which these CGs um, were located. So I had four mutants that had the same number of CGs at the same location, but uh, I modified the surrounding sequence to have a maximum level of A's, C's, G's, and U's. Um, and what I found is adding G's had very little effects in virus replication, but adding A's or U's significantly attenuated this virus, suggesting that ZAP prefers an AU-rich sequence surrounding those CGs. I also found that 
adding cytosines had a deleterious effect in virus replication, but this was ZAP independent, and we still don't really know what's going on. All right, so we figured all these rules for HIV, but the test for us really came when we tried to apply these rules to a completely different and unrelated virus. And for that, we chose a virus called enterovirus A71, which is a single-stranded uh, positive sensor RNA virus that causes a disease called uh, hand, foot, and mouth disease um, in infants and young children. And most of the times, this disease is quite mild, but sometimes it can lead to more severe complications, such as meningitis, encephalitis, and acute flaccid paralysis. Um, and another reason why we chose this virus is that um, uh, this virus had fairly low levels of CG dinucleotides, not as low as HIV, but much lower than other viruses that were naturally sensitive to ZAP. So I chose a region of about a thousand nucleotides in which I introduced 16 CGs. They were optimally placed away from each other and modified the surrounding sequence to have a maximum of A frequency. So when replicating the wild type virus in either ZAP positive here in black or ZAP negative cells in white, we see very little effect. When we just increase the frequency of A's, then we see a little bit of an effect that is ZAP dependent, probably just highlighting the CGs that are already placed there. When we add CGs alone, again, we see a very little effect, but nothing to write home about. And it's only when we do both so when we increase the frequency of A's and we uh, increase the number of CG's that we see a much bigger effect, suggesting that these rules were also true in enterovirus A71. So what about in vivo? And um, mice are sensitive, can be infected with these virus, but the only developed symptoms, is they were infected very early on in their development. And the symptoms that we see is the development of one limb paralysis or two limb paralysis. Um, and this is sort of the uh, symptoms we tracked. So when infecting with wild type virus, we see that disease progresses very similarly between ZAP positive and ZAP negative mice. And indeed, most of the mice uh, did not survive infection and they die within 20 days after infection. However, if we infect with our recoded CG-rich virus, we see something different. We see that mice that lack ZAP, they do succumb to disease and they progress to the disease as similarly to wild type, but most of the ZAP-positive mice were completely resistant in developing symptoms, and indeed most of them survived infection, suggesting that ZAP was also protecting mice from the infection with the recoded CG-rich virus. And this is also true at the level of the RNA. So for example, in wild type um, EV71, we see comparable levels of RNA, of viral RNA there is. However, in the recoded CG rich virus, we see much lower RNA levels in ZAP positive mice compared to the ZAP negative. Um, and then we thought that maybe we could use this as a vaccine and to test if the infection with the CG-rich recoded virus generated uh, neutralizing antibodies, we initially bled the mice that um, survived infection with the CG-rich virus. And in a neutralization assay in vitro, it did uh, inhibit replication of wild type EV71. Uh, but since these mice were only susceptible to infection um, a couple days after they are born, we had to do a maternal antibody protection experiment. And to do that, we took females that survived infection with the CG rich virus, and we made them with males that had never seen um, enterovirus A71. We then infected their uh, offspring with the wild type virus, and we monitored disease progression. Um, during this period. And what we saw is for um, pups that were from mothers that were never exposed to enterovirus A71, um, disease progressed very similarly. And again, most of them die after infection. In pups that were from mothers that survived infection with our recoded CG rich virus, um, most of them did not develop any symptoms, and indeed, most of them survived infection. Um, suggesting that this could be um, a new technology to um, generate live attenuated vaccines that is 
conditional to the expression of ZAP. So just in summary, this is a collection of the, the features that I found that I, are important for ZAP. So the number of CGs seems to be important with at least in HIV and EBC one about 15 CGs to be sufficient to attenuate these viruses. The spacing between them seems to be crucial to allow uh, specific bindings of multiple ZAP uh, proteins. And overall, having an AU-rich sequence seems to also impact um, virus replication. And again, this was shown to be true both in uh, human cells in vitro and in the uh, mouse ZAP knockouts that we generated. And I would just like to um, acknowledge all the people in the lab of retrovirology at the Rockefeller University um, and Professor Yoko Fan Chan from the University of Malaya, who shared with us the reverse genetics uh, for enterovirus 71 and the CRISPR and Genome Editing Center at the Rockefeller University who generated the ZAP knockout mouse line that we used. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Daniel, very much. That was a great talk, very uh, robust and detailed work. Um, so we'll move on to our next talk now. Again, those of you uh, listening, please send in your questions to the chat box. Our third invited speaker is Gail Hoggle from the University of St. Andrews University in, in Scotland. Gail is a biochemist with um, experience in protein science, including DNA repair, protein quality control in Archaea. Her current research prog project focuses on bacterial immune defense systems, and she's a postdoctoral researcher in uh, St. Andrews University. Uh, today, Gail will present her work titled, How can a super helical structure be a cell killer? the case of a bacterial tear immune effector. That's the floor, Gail. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm glad to be here today to share with you the story I've been working on uh, during my postdoc in the lab of Malcolm White. And here we're going to dive a little bit more in the world of bacteria because, well, they also have to fight uh, viruses, um, but even if in their case we call them bacteriophages. And to do so, they display different uh, mechanisms uh, to uh, stop the, the spreading of bacteriophages or to try to, to avoid spreading to all colonies. And there are so many mechanisms, and you probably know one quite well, at least by the name, is a CRISPR-Cas uh, system that is mainly known, um, but it's not only a really good uh, genetic uh, tool to edit the genome, but for bacteria, it's important, and it's part of some of them, uh, of an adaptive immune memory. But I'm not here to talk about the CRISPR-Cas system. I'm all here to try to show you that there are many dif different mechanisms, and I would like to introduce you to a kind of one specific strategy that the bacteria can use. And it's a strategy that could seem a bit extreme, but in the case where you have a cell infected by bacteriophages, if the cell is not able to fight properly to stop the, um, the infection cycle, the bacteriophage will spread to hold the colony. So when fighting back is not enough, some bacteria has developed a kind of last solution to uh, stop the spread infection. And this is what we call, well, the abortive infection, where you have one infected bacteria that will uh, trigger uh, different mechanisms that will lead to the death of this infected bacteria. So to stop the, um, the infection cycle and to avoid the spreading of all the bacteriophages to all the colonies, so the colony could um, survive. So this extreme, for this extreme solution, bacteria has developed uh, different mechanisms and they could be quite creative for that and i would like to show you well i will start to spoil my own presentation by showing you a structure of one protein that is involved in this kind of abortive infection mechanisms and this protein uh, makes a kind of filament here and this is the active form that will be essential to start the um, the dying process of the cells. But let me restart at the beginning of this story. And here, it's, the story started with a ring, but a chemical ring that is made of 
uh, uh, three molecules of NTP, AMP that has been um, that are cyclic, cyclic molecules that we gave, I gave the nickname of CA3. And these cyclic nucleotides are more generally used as uh, messenger molecules in different uh, signaling pathway. But in the case of um, immune defense system, here we have some uh, in bacteria we have some cyclic enzyme that are able to use either ATP, GTP, or the nucleotide molecule to um, to create a cyclic nucleotides in response to uh, the phage infection, and this cyclic nucleotides will be bound by a downstream effector protein that could be a nuclease that would degrade uh, all uh, DNA or RNA or phospholipase or other proteins that will degrade essential molecule. And in this process, the cell will die at the end. This different mechanism have been uh, really recently described in the last uh, few years and they are gathered under one name that we call the CBAS for a system that uses cyclic nucleotide as an antiviral strategy. And in our lab, we started to look at different systems uh, based on bioinformatic work. And we stop our interest in one um, bacteria that I will nickname with the NTE. And we found that uh, in this uh, in its genome, more, genera more generally, uh, human defense systems are gathered into a kind of defense highland operon into the genome of bacteria. So, for example, if you look at uh, this, try to find a cyclic homologue here in green, you can find in the neighborhood uh, of this gene other genes that could be involved in the same uh, system, the same pathway. So here I started to work on one protein that could be a putative effector protein working with a cyclist that is called the TF saved because its part is organized in two domains, a TRI domain with a putative um, enzymatic activity and the saved domain that I've been described to sense a molecule including cyclic molecules. So the first question was what is the nature of the signal for the cyclist to communicate with the effector protein? To do so, we did uh, the purification of the different proteins in vitro, and we incubate everything together to do some enzymatic assay. And we find out that the cyclase, by using ATP, was able to produce a CA3 um, molecules. And if we put that together with a tear saved and some substrate of the tear saved, we were able to see an activity by the degradation of the NED here in the ADP ribose that emit fluorescence in our assays. So this is a signal you can see here in the figure where we have everything together, ATP cyclase and the tear saved. So clearly the signal molecule was CA3. And when we try to move it by um, another kind of cyclic molecule like CA2, CA4, CA6, it didn't work. It was really specific uh, to uh, the cyclic 3 and T molecule. So the next question was, well, as we are biochemists uh, working also with structural biologists, the next question was, um, what is the activation mechanism behind this? How the binding of CS3 will um, trigger the tear as uh, NADS activity? To do so, we did a collaboration uh, with the University of Glasgow, where they analyzed uh, by microscopy the complex form uh, between uh, tear saved and the CS3 molecules. And strikingly, they were, um, managed to observe with this really nice proteal filament here, really well organized, that uh, we started to to nickname with this, as a slinky protein in reference to this toy here, because it make a very stretch slinky uh, structure here. And thanks to the solving of the structure by a combination of cryo -EM, but also the use of alpha fold to get at least a structure of one uh, subunit of tear set, they were able to show that this filament is composed uh, by several subunits um, going side by side here, like in a configuration of uh, front to back, where you have the CS3 molecules bound between two safe domains here in a sandwich very packed tightly. 
And this can make a very long uh, pitch to form this helical um, uh, filament. And this configuration allows to have an interaction interface between the two head of the pro protein, between uh, the two TR domain here. So the two uh, are really close together and you have an opening between the loops that allow to create a kind of composite active site where you we were able to modelize um, the binding of a potential substrate here going into the active site pocket where you have the catalytic residue here. But this is what we observe as all in vitro. And the next question was, uh, do we have, what could happen in vivo, in cellular? Do we have, what happened to, to the cell if we activate tear saved? So we use a kind of artificial model um, by using E. coli cell, where we introduce uh, our tear safety. But instead of the cyclase, uh, we put instead, we don't, didn't control very well, we put instead a type 3 CRISPR complex on the gene to make this uh, complex that uh, is inducible when it recognizes the target mRNA. It will not only cleave it, but it will also uh, produce cyclic nucleotides, and including the CS3 molecule that's supposed to activate the tear safe. So the idea was to observe what will happen when we have all this system together activated. So we observe the transformant of uh, this experiment and clearly um, when we use the full active form of tear safe, so able to make a filament and also have any DS activity, the phenotype was, was quite striking. We did not have growth of the cells or where they were dying in the process, so, meaning that something happened. But when we used a mutated version of tear saved where the head we which is mutated one residue to uh, stop the NEDS activity, but the protein was still able to make this filament, we recover the phenotype like in the control here. So this meant two things. Well, at least that the filament structure itself finally is maybe not responsible to the, the death of the cell. It's really the action, the combination of production of CS3 and um, activation of the TRI domain with the NEDS activity that seems to be responsible of the dying of the cell. But the question was after, well, the cell, we observed that the cell died when it produced uh, this, uh, when it activates this protein, but do we really need to have such a long filament like I show you uh, in the first video? To, to have a fully activated um, complex. Can we maybe try to control it? Can we maybe have some activity if we only observe, uh, have a, a dimer of the protein, just to subunit? To try to understand this, we, try, we play Lego with different mutants of the proteins, where we mutated different residue, mainly around the CS3 binding pocket, with, we did some reversal of charge, and to make a long story short, I just show you we managed to identify two mutants, the pink one here and the blue one. And when we put them together, we were able to have the binding of CS3 purify the dimer. But when we tested the NADS activity, it wasn't active at all. So two subunits seems to not be enough to uh, activate the TRI domain. But when we did another combination with this pink mutant and this gray one here, where you can just have oligomerization by one side, we were able to recover a bit of uh, NEDS activity. So I think really this structure uh, in filament uh, is quite important to have the right conformation to activate the TRI domain. If I summarize a bit as this part of the story, here we work on kind of a one bacteria that display an operon corresponding to a CBAS mechanism to fight phage infection. And so we have the cyclades that use ATP to produce CS3. And this is CS3 is bound by the safe domain and lead to oligomerization of the proteins. And this oligomerization is a kind of open structure because as soon as you had CS3 and proteins, it can grow some, it's nearly unless if you don't stop that. 
And this oligomerization is essential to activate the TRI domain that will degrade the NED molecule that is an essential cofactor in the cell. And it seems that TR activation uh, is responsible of the death of the cell. So we publish all the details are published um, have been published uh, last summer. There are still some questions remaining around that. For example, well, we are not uh, completely sure that any depression is a reason uh, why the cell dies, or if maybe there is some other mechanisms um, below this. And we still try to understand uh, what is the mechanism to activate the cyclase, at which step of the cy um, infection cycle this process uh, starts, and how the other protein of the operon can regulate all of this. And I would like just to uh, continue with uh, to put everything in more in the evolutionary context, because here we work. I work on in bacteria uh, tear safe proteins, but the tear domains are concerning the three domains of life: bacteria, um, archaea, and eukaryotes. We have really recently we have really nice example of uh, tear proteins that makes this kind of nice long structure, complex structure. But we also have this in eukaryotic cells, and a good examples are uh, with the plant NLR human receptor. We have here this extremity, a TRR domain, and but also in the protein, in the human protein, uh, someone where um, that we have also a TRR domain, and the oligomerization process is a key step to trigger the NADS activity of these uh, proteins. And in the both example here, when any disease activity uh, is, is is triggered, you have the it starts the process of uh, the death of the cell. So in the case of someone, it's involved in uh, neuron degeneration. And as we are in a early career researcher um, a webinar, I maybe wanted to to finish with a kind of message uh, showing that well in we do not always control where science leads us, and like the picture of this tree, sometimes you can follow a main route, uh, but sometimes you have to maybe jump from branch to another. That was maybe my case where I work in bacteria, archaea, and now I'm working on the eukaryotic cells. But whatever happens, I think well, for each experience, it's worth having and makes our research journey. So from this, I would like to thank. Um, all the people involved uh, in this work. Here, this is a picture of the Malcolm Wright group. Here, this is Malcolm. Um, and I would like to thank the group of Laura Spagnolo with her PhD student, Happy Gates, that uh, they both did a really great job um, with the Scottish Center for Microbial Imaging to sort the structure of uh, these really nice proteins. And, this, and today, the good job is still ongoing. We have a group um, at the Roslyn Franklin Institute where they are working on the tear safe protein more uh, in, in the cellular context to observe this uh, filament. And I would like to uh, thank you all for listening and thanks the Biochemical Society for this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kaya. That was very interesting indeed and I hope you will get a lot of good questions. So we can now uh, welcome questions from any of our speakers, uh, for any of our speakers, should I say. If you have a question, please type it into the question box. I kept on saying the chat box, but I meant the question box as shown in the image on the, the screen. Our speakers are ready and willing to answer questions. So let me go to the question box. Okay, I have a question here for Daniel. It says, do you have a hypothesis as to why C is acting independently with regards to ZAP? Uh, so that has been a very um, difficult pro uh, project to study. Um, we do think there are some defects on um, RNA transcription. Um, so maybe it's blocking um, you know, Genovo expression soon after virus, the HIV genome gets integrated. Um, I tried with a couple of different ways of trying to understand exactly what proteins were blocking uh, RNA transcription. Couldn't really find anything yet. Um, you can definitely reduce um, 
this effect that we're seeing if we reduce the number of cytosines. So same thing as we see with, with the CGs, but I don't really know what's causing that. And uh, I, you know, it's something we were working on still. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. The question for Anna here. How is the expression of CD20 related to bleeding? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So, I mean, this is something that we are uh, currently, I mean, currently we were really working a bit with our students. So something that we observe in CD20 um, knockout as well is that we see an effect on a wave complex or the level of um, wave tool seems to be changed in C20 and there that's that's in fact a bit of background story how we also related our results to mTOR because there is a relation between mTOR activity in cells and uh, wave tool complex so this is what we think currently maybe one of the reasons another thing is that we also see um, as I showed you, increased uh, calcium fluxes and something that is unfortunately quite difficult to test experimentally uh, is what we know that um, increasing calcium levels um, can activate um, proteins that severe actin, like um, for example, gel solin, but they are very difficult. The experiments in B in cells um, to look at activity of this protein is very difficult, first of all. Um, so this is something that we need to kind of figure out exactly how to look at. Or um, things blabbing can also arise due to increased contractility. And we as well see increased uh, phosphomyosin activity in our cells. Um, it can be simply because we have increased uh, myosin, uh, non-muscle myosin activity in our cells. So in fact, we have three current hypotheses that seem to be potentially um, possible still in the cells, and we are investigating this right now. Okay. I have a, a related question for you, Anna. Does treatment with drugs that block bleb formation or actin reorganization also restore the immunological synapse in CDA20 knockout cells? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So in fact, we tested quite a lot of different drugs, and um, so far um, we, re in fact, one um, so in fact one of the drugs that indeed inhibits um, actin contractility can restore, but this was quite expected. We haven't tested the bistatin yet, so this probably would uh, restore 100% um, blebbing. But of course, um, the question would be: uh, Is this, of course, the mechanism um, by which CD20 works, or is it just because we kind of stop, let's say, contractility from happening. But yeah, that's a very good question. Okay, thanks. I have another one for Daniel here. It says, you spoke of RNA viruses. Have you considered any of these factors in DNA viruses? That's from Katie Lavin. Uh, yeah, so DNA viruses can also be sensitive to ZAP. Um, so we know that CMV, cytomegalovirus, and uh, herpes virus can be sensitive to ZAP. Um, I haven't tested modifying their genomes because they're usually very large genomes and they are overall more CG rich. Um, at least for herpes, it encodes a way of counteracting ZAP. Um, so that would be a little bit difficult to address, but I bet there are, you know, small DNA viruses that have low CGs in which this will be an interesting model to, to test our roles in, yeah, for sure. Okay. I have a question for Gail and from Nicola. As a patient who has lived with systemic sclerosis for 25 years, I wish the slinky causative protein could be discovered. Do you see any advancement with the biological, biologic therapies for protein discovery? Um, so if I understand well the question, but potential therapeutic um, application, why right, was this kind of slinky protein? This yeah, was a question. Exactly. Well, 
not well, specific this protein, but all protein, I would say, that are able to, um, well, we can induce this kind of protein to to trigger a process of uh, dying cell could be used more in a kind of strategy for bacteria um, for bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, for example. It will be more a system like this. Um, but the filament itself, uh, the slinky protein, um, to be honest, I think it would be quite interesting to see if there are some other applications for it. Um, maybe more a kind of martial way uh, for this, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, we have one for Daniel. Since RNA viruses are unstable and exposed to mutations at high levels, how are you still how are they still sensitive to ZAP? Do they get resistance at some point to ZAP? Uh, yeah, that's a very important um, thing to consider. Uh, so a lot of the RNA viruses that infect humans, actually that infect mammals, they generally have very low levels of CG dinucleotides, which the assumption is that they have evolved to uh, escape the action um, of ZAP. If you look at viruses that infect insects, for example, that don't have ZAP, they have much higher levels of CG dinucleotides. I mm. didn't show you today, but I've also tested um, how stable these mutations are in vitro. So these modifications that I made, and if you have a significant number of CGs, at least in culture, the virus cannot recover from that. The virus, those mutations will never arise. However, if you just reduce the le that threshold, if you reduce those CGs to just a few CGs, the virus can very, very quickly um, mutate and escape ZAP, definitely by losing CGs. I've got a couple of questions of my own. So the first is, is, is for Gail, and it, it's related to the aggregation those, those, that, that uh, oligo, oligomerization, is it known whether there's a conformational change to result in that oligomerization or not? From this oligomerization, uh, we we think, well, and we observe we have a conformational change between um, between two TRI domains, like I say, because with this filament doing a, a curve, we have a kind of very nice curve where you have the loop, the subunit together makes some change between the loop, and I think this is really part of the system that trigger um, the, the activity of the TRI domain. So, because, yeah, and this seems the cryo show us, so we have a kind of different movement between the subunit each other, if you go to go deeper in the detail. They are not exactly in the same position. We have a slight motion between them. So it seems to be something dynamic. Okay. 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 So uh, we've come to the, to the end of, of our discussion. And I'd just like to thank our three speakers, Gail, Anna, and Danielle, for just excellent talks. I think uh, science is in good hands for the future. So thank you everyone for attending and thanks to the speakers. Uh, you can continue this conversation online if you follow at BiochemSoc and at PP Publishing on Twitter. So it can go on. In addition, we are currently welcoming submissions for speakers to present their work in the 2023 uh, Early Career uh, Researcher webinar series. If you've been inspired by any of these speakers today and would like the same opportunity to present your own research, then please consider submitting an abstract for consideration by the 20th of February. Visit our website for more details. Uh, all our upcoming webinars are listed on the website as well. And if you have missed any of the 50 or so webinars that were already run as part of the series or, or would like to watch them again, please visit our website or YouTube channels. The recording from today's webinar will also be available to watch within the next couple of weeks. Finally, I want to highlight that it's more important than ever to stay connected and engage with your fellow molecular bioscientists. Join the Biochemical Society's community of researchers and specialists and take advantage of key benefits, including discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings, exclusive access to a wide range of grants and bursaries, personal on online access to two of their journals and more. Visit the website to find out more. Okay, so it uh, just remains for me to, to thank everybody. Thank everybody for tuning in. Thanks for the questions. And finally, again, Thank you so much to our speakers. Excellent talks. Well done.